Welcome to the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of Canada's presentation titled Demystifying Grief and Honoring Loss, Exploring Healing and Moving Forward. The LLSC's mission is to cure blood cancers and improve the quality of life of patients and their families. We offer guidance and support to people affected by blood cancer every step of the way. Our special guest today is C. Elizabeth Doherty. Elizabeth is a social worker and educator with extensive experience supporting children, youth, and adults facing serious illness, uncertainty, and grief. After specializing in palliative care at the largest cancer treatment center in Canada, she started a community-based private practice offering in-person and virtual care across Ontario. Elizabeth provides individual, family, and group counseling following diagnosis of a serious illness, into remission, at the end of life, and into bereavement. She collaborates on regional, provincial, and national initiatives, advocating for greater access to high quality palliative and end of life care. She teaches courses, seminars, and workshops to the general public, undergraduate, graduate, postgraduate learners, and professionals across settings and sectors. As part of her volunteer compassionate community initiative, Elizabeth is a clinical lead for Camp Air in Toronto, a free bereavement camp for kids and teens, and is on the resource development committee with Canadian Virtual Hospice, creating free resources like kidsgrief.ca, Kids Grief for Educators, and Teen Grief. Elizabeth is a community partner with the Children and Youth Grief Network and is an assistant clinical professor adjunct with the Department of Family Medicine, Division of Palliative Care at McMaster University. Thank you for being here today, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Sonia. And hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your time. As Sonia mentioned, um, this is an important conversation to have, and I know it's a series of conversations. So while we have a short time today, I'd like to just provide an overview of some of the things I'd like to highlight as part of this discussion. I'd like to reflect on some attitudes and beliefs about grief and loss. This is so impactful on how we as individuals and as a society grieve. I'd like to also demystify loss and grief and specifically acknowledge some different types of grief and further explore how we metabolize those experiences. I also want to acknowledge the universal experiences of loss and grief while also recognizing the unique impact that those have on individuals, on families, and certainly on healthcare providers as well. And lastly, I'd like to highlight some resources and ask that you consider those as each one of us navigate grief as a collective, but certainly how each one of us explore considerations for our own self-care and what healing looks like as we move forward. So moving forward, as we begin, I'd like to ask you to consider the intersection. And while this is a picture that certainly looks unfamiliar at this point in time because of COVID, which speaks to a whole other range of loss experiences that have everything and nothing to do with dying and death. This intersection though, this meeting place for us today is I appreciate each one of us arrive at these places and spaces with unique lived experiences, carrying different roles, identities, demands, and indeed traumas, grief, and loss experiences. I recognize as a result of that, we don't arrive at this meeting place with the same experiences. That is so important to consider as we go forward because what grief and loss looks like and what healing looks like is unique for each person. So I want to honor all that you bring today and all that you are as we move forward. And moving forward today, I ask that you consider how and why this information may be relevant for you, but also for the people you love. So as mentioned, I'd like to reflect for a short while on some attitudes and beliefs about grief and loss. As mentioned, this is so impactful and there is so much stigma about loss and grief. Stigma even in terms of acknowledging grief itself. Many people talk about feeling broken and don't quite understand why. They feel like they're doing something wrong, that they should feel better, that they should move on or be able to fix how they're feeling. 
again, for many people, it's so difficult to acknowledge without obvious outward signs and symbols. And again, there's so much stigma from society as a whole, expecting people to just move on, stay positive. So grief itself, there's so much stigma around it, but people who are grieving often talk about feeling stigmatized, isolated. So I ask, what does stigma mean for you in terms of your own experiences with loss and grief? How do you or your loved ones or your experience or, or of loss or grief often feel like it's right there in the middle of the room, but no one even acknowledges it? What does that mean for you? And when I spoke about reflecting on attitudes and beliefs about loss and grief, I want to highlight this because certainly as a healthcare professional myself, I see this all the time. And it's important to recognize that as healthcare providers, we're all human too. And I know that's stating the obvious. The reason I mention it though is when people turn to the healthcare system for direction, for guidance, for support, for information. This study, the survey that was conducted by the Way Forward Initiative, Canadian initiative, looking at integrating hospice palliative care. When they surveyed Canadian general practitioners, family physicians, and nurses, it's important to highlight this. Less than one quarter of Canadian general practitioners and physicians and nurses reported that they're actually experienced and comfortable talking about planning for illness and end of life with their patients, talking about advanced care planning, for instance. So what does it mean when you turn to the healthcare system looking for guidance, talking about serious illness or even end of life? And of course, intrinsically wrapped up in all of that is loss experiences, our grief experiences. So if the people you're turning to to guide you through your treatment, through your care, not just the person being treated, but for the family themselves, if they are not feeling comfortable or prepared, how do you then have answer, questions answered? How do you have a space to explore what's concerning you? And this is also important to recognize because acute care hospitals, thankfully, are brilliant at focusing on short-term episodic care and these interventions and treatments that are aimed at curing. But what does that mean then when someone's illness can't be cured? What it does is it creates an environment where death is seen as a failure or where death is denied. Again, turning to healthcare providers, you may not know that training around loss and grief is not mandatory or integrated into any healthcare provider's training and education. It's often elective, if at all. It's usually incumbent upon the person to, to access their own training and education around loss and grief. So what that means is the care providers who are helping you navigate these experiences are practicing in an environment where death is seen as a failure or death is denied. Again, adding to the stigma around loss and grief. And the impact of this is tremendous. And this is a phrase I've heard time and again within the healthcare system. I'm sorry, we've lost him. Now you can see here, there's presumably a parent with a small child. Now, the reason you can see all of these healthcare providers looking all over the place is because this is one of those phrases that is so misleading for kids and teens. And it speaks to the discomfort around using the words dying or death, even within the healthcare system. So if healthcare providers are uncomfortable using the words dying or death, how then are parents, caregivers, aunts, uncles, grandparents, to use the words dying or death when they're speaking to their kids and teens about someone dying, whether that's a parent, a caregiver, or a sibling. So the word lost is often used when someone's explaining dying or death, but it's so confusing for kids and teens. Again, speaking to the stigma within the system. It's so important to consider the impact of our words and in the words of Nelson Mandela, how precious words are and how real speech is and its impact on the way people live and die. How do we address the stigma and create spaces where individuals and families can feel supported to have these conversations? It's important to recognize that modern medicine indeed, as mentioned, focuses on cure and fixing. In bereavement though, specifically bereavement meaning once someone has died, 
that type of grief. In bereavement, healing focuses on care and process. It's about learning to sit with grief. And that sitting with demonstrates a sense of presence that is open and engaged and compassionate. So essential for healthcare providers, but certainly for friends and family. Again, when so many want to move on, fix, or cure. It's important to acknowledge in the words of Dr. Ira Bayek, a fantastic palliative care physician and wonderful author. As Ira Bayek speaks about the fact that it's important to acknowledge that dying isn't medical, it's personal. And it is so easy to lose that. Again, considering the impact on the individual and family when a death is medicalized. What about the personal, the human impact? So thinking about that as a framework in terms of how loss and grief is perceived within the system, is stigmatized within the system, again, because there's so much discomfort. What do we do as we face loss and grief? As a starting point, I'd like to just simply explain grief and loss a little bit more if I could. And these are from the words of Ken, Dr. Kenneth Doka, who's a clinician, educator, and researcher. And this is a really important distinction that grief is a reaction to loss. And while it is often confused as a reaction to death, it's really just a very natural reaction to loss. When we lose any significant form of attachment, any significant form of attachment, grief is the process of adjusting. In the words of Dr. Earl Grohlman, he further explains grief is not a disorder. Grief is not a disease and grief is not a sign of weakness. Grief is the emotional, physical, and spiritual necessity. It is the price we pay for love. And the only cure for grief is to grieve. Again, thinking about the impact on the whole person, emotional, physical, spiritual. And I'll speak to that a little bit more. Now, I'd also like to talk about some different types of grief because, again, many people assume that grief only happens when someone is actively dying or has died. There's so much more than that. I think, again, it's thinking about what loss and grief means to you. And this is actually taken from Instagram from something called the Grief Project. Um, this actually highlights a wonderful expression, a creative expression of what grief looks like. And I work with kids and teens and adults all the time. And a lot of people say, well, I'm not an artist. I don't know if I should try to draw anything or do anything creative. Again, what might it look like as an outlet for you? But this represents an outlet for the grief project of what grief looks like. Looking at all of the different words, what does grief look like for you? As represented here, sleeplessness, denial, tears, rage, uncertainty regret, anxiety, acceptance, pain. What does it mean for you? So talking about some different types of grief, this is from a fabulous free resource called What's Your Grief? I highly recommend if you'd like to learn more, they've got lots of great, easy to read articles around all different facets of grief and grieving. These next few slides are taken directly from their website. So, Speaking about this first loss, again, one that's often not understood by many people, non-death loss. A person can grieve the loss of anything significant to their physical, psychological, spiritual, and interpersonal lives. Throughout a person's life, they will experience many non-death losses. Some will feel minor and manageable, while others feel devastating and life-altering. How often? Have you experienced non-death losses? How have you acknowledged or honored those losses? Or conversely, have they been minimized, dismissed, or overlooked? What does this look like for you and the people you love? Secondary loss. Now this is something that I often see people carry this burden and not quite understand why it feels so burdensome. Secondary loss is so important to understand. After experiencing a devastating loss, grieving people are often surprised to find there is a ripple effect of subsequent losses. The primary loss causes such significant shifts and fractures that there's a domino effect of losses related to things like finances, friends, 
community, worldview, faith, sense of self, and the list goes on. Secondary losses are true for non-death losses as well as death-related losses. And this next slide actually is another um, image from What's Your Grief? This highlights that primary loss of the person who died, but also highlights some of those secondary losses that can happen as part of that experience. Like I said, many people just feel this heavy burden and weight of carrying these secondary losses, but not acknowledging, not honoring the fact that this is part of their grief experience and how multifaceted and multidimensional it can be. So important to recognize secondary losses and the impact. Ambiguous loss. This happens when you're grieving someone who is still living, and we see this lots of times for someone who has, for instance, something like dementia. It's different than the grief you experience when someone you love dies. That kind of loss is finite and certain, and there's no question you should feel pain. Ambiguous loss happens when someone or something profoundly changes or disappears. This can also happen when someone lives with cancer and advancing cancer. A person feels torn between hope that things will return to normal and the looming sense that life as they knew it is fading away like a Polaroid developing in reverse. Ambiguous loss is so common in complex illness and cancer. Cumulative loss. We see so much of this right now globally in the face of COVID, but certainly in the face of any diagnosis of cancer. Cumulative loss refers to the experience of suffering a new loss before you have the chance to grieve a first loss or suffering multiple losses in quick succession. It's important to note grieving the death of a loved one is never really done. And it's common for new losses to bring up memories and emotions about past losses. So some amount of cumulative grief is almost always a given. Consider what cumulative loss looks like and feels like for you. Non-finite loss. From childhood, people form ideas about how they think and hope their lives will turn out. People imagine, make choices, and work towards the future that they think they want and in some cases need. But many things are out of one's control. And when someone doesn't have the child or partner or job or life they want, they may experience non-finite grief. Non-finite grief is something a person may carry with them for a long time as they struggle with the push and pull of trying to achieve their hopes and dreams, but continually finding that life falls short, falls short of their expectations. What does non-finite loss look like for you? And anticipatory grief. It's that grief that occurs before a potential loss. Anytime circumstances lead a person to think that death is a real possibility, they might start to grieve aspects of that loss. Again, thinking about primary and secondary losses. This is true for those as well. Anticipatory grief doesn't mean that a person will grieve any less. It just may mean that they process elements of the loss more slowly and over time. What does anticipatory grief look like and feel like for you? Disenfranchised grief. It's the grief a person feels when they're denied the right to grieve by family, friends, community members, or society on the whole. There are so many examples of this. When a loss is disenfranchised, it means the grieving person isn't getting the support or validation they need. And this of course means different things for different people where one person only needs validation from within themselves, Another person may feel they need the acknowledgement of the entire family or community or society. Regardless, the impact of disenfranchised grief is that the person experiencing it feels isolated, feels alienated, invalidated, ashamed, and weak. Again, considering how common this is and not named or acknowledged, the impact is so real. So while loss and grief is universal, it is so important to consider how unique these experiences are for each person. And this is from a fabulous resource that I use with kids and teens called Art with Heart. And this is really exploring the impact. In this case, I'm asking you to consider the impact of diving below the surface, the impact of the loss itself. 
I often use the example when I broke my wrist snowboarding with my kids, I had a big purple cast on my arm. It was obvious to anyone looking at me that something in my arm was healing. I clearly had broken a bone. I had this big purple cast as an outward sign and symbol, hey, this part of me is healing. In grief, we don't have a big purple cast to let everybody know what's below the surface. Much like navigating the healthcare system and asking for what you need, grief is one of those experiences where we first must come and become aware of what we need exploring the impact for ourselves below the surface and using that to move us forward, which of course, when we go through life altering events, when our world is forever changed, the impact of that loss is tremendous. But starting with acknowledgement, what is true for you below the surface as you explore the impact of loss. And as you can see, there are a range of words and experiences mentioned here. Thoughts and feelings, from pain to happiness. What does this look like for you? Because all of these things are valid. It's also so important to consider the impact beyond the individual. And I can tell you in my experience over the past few decades, everybody protects the people they love, which often means that in protecting the people they love, they don't always prepare themselves and those they love, certainly for the impact, but also for how to move forward. I can tell you the biggest conversations I've had with parents, whether parents are in their 20s or 40s or 60s or 80s, is I'm not sure what to tell the kids. Again, remembering that context I spoke about within the healthcare system. If you're not given that space to explore what that looks like for you and for the people you love, when I say people you love, believe family is best defined by the individual, whether that's biological connection or found family through community. But it's so important to remember, especially with kids and teens, when they're not told what's happening, they're often left to figure it out for themselves, which can create more isolation and uncertainty and additional fractures in relationship or losses. So it's so important to consider that grief itself impacts more than just one person. And in fact, it impacts everyone within that family. And I wanted to highlight some questions that kids and teens have asked at Camp Aaron. Again, as mentioned at the introduction, Camp Aaron, there are a couple of them in Canada, a free weekend bereavement camp for kids and teens from seven to 17 years of age. Of course, it was on hold this year, which speaks to another loss. But when we created a space, a free space for kids to share, and feel supported, a safe space where they wouldn't be judged. And these camps are staffed by volunteers, usually healthcare professionals and teachers and lots of people who want to create a supportive space for kids and teens as they explore their own grief and bereavement. But when kids and teens were given a safe space to ask questions about grief and loss, now bearing in mind to attend this camp, it has to be at least six months from the death of either their parent, caregiver, or sibling. And that can be six months to a couple of years. So bearing that in mind as I share these questions that these kids and teens asked at Camp Aaron, knowing that it's at least six months since their person died, these were questions that kids and teens carried with them. But when given a safe space to ask, they readily asked. Now this is just a sampling of a few questions. So some questions kids and teens asked after their parent, caregiver, or sibling died. How do people die? How do you have a heart attack? Are they going to come back? Do they turn into angels? Will he still be in pain? When you get something like cancer, how does it spread? After my dad had a heart attack, he was on a huge breathing machine. Could he hear us? Was he in pain? Could he try to move? Why does chemotherapy make some people lose their hair from cancer? Why can you get paralyzed but still feel someone? A few more questions. What are the different cancers? How do the doctors fix you when you have cancer? Why do you die and get cancer? How do people get cancer? Why might someone want to kill themselves? If someone in your family had cancer, is it likely you will get cancer? And is it the same process for everyone who dies? Now, if you're wondering why there's a difference in um, 
uh, writing styles there. Some of the kids and teens wanted to write their own cards out and others asked the volunteer camp counselors to write the questions out for them. All of these questions are straight from the kids and teens who attended camp. And there were so many more. So again, what would it mean to create an open, safe, non-judgmental space for kids and teens to ask questions about loss and grief before someone dies, but certainly after? Speaks to this closure and the myth of closure. And this is so important to highlight. Closure is, is a word that is used, a term that is used so often referencing that someone now has closure so they can move on with their lives or get back to normal. It's so important to recognize that closure in grief and grieving is a myth and there is no end point in grief, that we will continue to grieve someone or something after a loss as long as we maintain that connection. It speaks to the depth of that connection. And we can remain connected in our grief. It's something called continuing bonds. And actually, What's Your Grief has got some great uh, writing about continuing bonds, how we maintain a connection to someone or something honoring that connection after the loss. But it's also important to recognize that grieving that loss means learning to move forward and carry the loss with us in meaningful and healthy ways. We don't close a door on loving, meaningful relationships. And we can't close the door on grief and grieving for those people we love the most. There is no end point in grief and closure is a myth. And this is a great example of what that looks like. You know, people have heard about the stages of grief and grieving. And again, there is no stage process where you move through one stage to the next in a linear, straightforward fashion. That grief and grieving looks so much like the image on the right moving back and forth. And actually there's something called the dual process model. Um, What's Your Grief also has uh, some great writing about this. And it highlights how normal it is to move back and forth between what they refer to as loss orientation, meaning the grief work itself, and restoration orientation, meaning moving forward. So moving back and forth, oscillating back and forth between loss orientation and restoration orientation and all that that means is such an essential part of our everyday life. Speaking very much to the fact that closure is a myth. And this is also an important consideration as well. And again, I hear many people say, I thought I was doing well. I didn't expect this. What's wrong with me that I'm having these thoughts or feelings? There's something uh, from Therese Rando that talks about subsequent temporary upsurges of grief. I'm going to explain a couple different examples of what this can look like or feel like, but I'll call them stugs for short. Stugs can be overwhelming because of the intensity or unexpected impact. Now, there's different types of stugs. Cyclical, which generally occur in a yearly cycle. So it could be a birthday, an anniversary, Whatever holiday is meaningful for you, when that birthday anniversary or holiday comes around again and the person you love is not there, you can experience a subsequent temporary upsurge in your grief. It's also linear in the sense that milestones certainly occur over time that we look forward to, like a graduation or a wedding or birth of a child or grandchild or retirement. And when these linear milestones occur over time, people experience a subsequent temporary upsurge in their grief. And I don't say that as a singular example. There are so many examples where this happens. And this one is certainly triggering for people because they don't often expect it or see it coming. The stimulus cued stugs, meaning it's triggered by something that stimulates any of the senses that could be taste or scent or sight or sound. That could be a song that comes on. That could be a picture you look at. That could be the smell of your favorite food or the taste of your favorite food. Anything that triggers something that stimulates the senses can bring you right back to a meaningful experience with that person you love. Or it can be a triggering, traumatizing experience that brings up that grief. So it's so important to recognize that subsequent temporary upsurges in grief are so common and so normal and are a normal part of grieving. It's important to recognize what this looks like or feels like for you and the people you love. How do you honor them? How do you prepare as best you can, recognizing 
that you might experience a stug, but also recognizing when you do experience them, the best thing you can do is be gentle with yourself, experience them, express them, and honor them in a way that honors your person that's died and cares for yourself. Because grief itself can be so traumatizing. Grief can overwhelm our coping mechanisms. It certainly can impact and change the way our brain functions, the way we behave, and it can create a further sense of isolation. It's also important to consider that grief absolutely changes our assumptions about the world. And it's important to consider that our identity and the many assumptions and beliefs we hold about our place in the world, the number of times I've heard people say, we didn't plan this, we'd hoped for this, you know, we'd hoped to retire, we'd hoped to get married, I'd hoped to see them graduate. The many assumptions we hold about our place in the world are immediately threatened in the face of trauma and loss. And depending on the nature of the trauma or loss, one's identity be, can, can be changed temporarily. I see this lots of times when people might lose their hair through chemo. They talk about the loss of identity and all that that means and those secondary losses. But identity can certainly be changed permanently, like after someone dies, when someone becomes a widow or a widower. And while it's important to recognize that commonalities indeed exist, that reactions to trauma and loss are unique for each person. And this is so true even within families. Now, I want to just highlight a definition of trauma, and this comes from CAMH, the Canadian Association for Mental Health, and they certainly have a range of free resources on their website. But it's important to recognize that trauma is the lasting response that often results from living through a distressing event, and that experiencing a traumatic event can harm a person's sense of safety, of self, of ability to regulate their emotions and navigate relationships. And long after a traumatic event occurs, people often talk about feeling shame, helpless, powerless, and fearful. It's also important to recognize that traumatic events are difficult to define because the same event may be traumatic for some and not for others. It's also something important to recognize called post-traumatic growth. Now, it's important to recognize the post part, meaning after the trauma. So this growth that can happen after the trauma. And it's important to consider that traumatic events are certainly not viewed as desirable by any means. But it's also important to know that stories of others moving through trauma are always important in post-traumatic growth. Whether that's talking to someone who's lived through a similar loss experience, whether that's reading a book, about someone who's talking about their experience or whether that's hearing a podcast. That connection through community can be so meaningful in healing and moving forward. It's also important to recognize that strength is often correlated almost paradoxically following an increased sense of being vulnerable. And again, as I mentioned, when people are already talking about trying to stay positive and feeling that pressure, not wanting to feel weak, I gently try to remind people this is part of the human experience. It's not about weakness. And in the words of Dr. Brene Brown, if you don't know who she is, I highly recommend two of her TED Talks. She's a PhD and she researches vulnerability. Her first TED Talk is on the power of vulnerability. Yes, you heard that right. And the second is exploring shame and guilt. Those concepts are so important in grief and grieving certainly following a diagnosis of any complex illness. What does it mean for the person diagnosed, but certainly their family? And it's so important to consider what that means when you're grieving. And in the words of Dr. Brene Brown, taken straight from her TED Talk, vulnerability is not weakness. And that myth is profoundly dangerous. Vulnerability is the birthplace of innovation, creativity, and change. And this is from Jack Cornfield, and he's got a number of free resources on his website. And he goes on to talk about how trauma comes in all shapes and sizes, and as human beings, we are all vulnerable to its potential effects. But how can we meet trauma with tenderness and courage? Because I can tell you firsthand from the number of people I speak to that self-talk, that inner judgment, so detrimental to their healing 
And healing is so often a precursor to the practice of liberation itself, but true release requires a familiarity with emotions and the capacity to be present for them. Jack talks about through mindfulness, we can develop the compassion necessary to approach our traumas. When we can first bear it, we then have a choice of what to do with it. Once our story can be told, it often loses its hold. Um, this is from Dr. Susan David, and she talks a lot about emotional agility and goes on to say our raw feelings, and I would say our raw thoughts and feelings can be the messengers we need to teach us about ourselves and can prompt insights into important life directions. But first, we need to make space to acknowledge them and honor them before they can prompt those insights into those important directions. This is actually from another resource on Instagram called Bless the Messy. And as this is acknowledged, it's important to sit with your feelings and your thoughts. Just remember, there will be an after. And Dr. Bestman Vandelkoek talks about how trauma can lodge in the body. And he goes on to say that mindfulness not only makes it possible to survey our internal landscape with compassion and curiosity, not judgment, but it can also actively steer us in the right direction for self-care. In order to change, people need to become aware of their sensations and the way their bodies interact with the world around them. Physical self-awareness is the first step in releasing the tyranny of the past. I think I often argue that self-awareness is a superpower. How do we first raise that awareness and acknowledge what our experience is like? And yes, this can be so stressful, anxiety provoking. So again, another resource from Instagram, simply highlighting one technique to ground yourself. So this is talking about focusing on your breathing, engaging your senses. Try and lessen the anxiety. What do you do when you feel anxious to ground yourself? What are some healthy things that you can do to foster that awareness, those thoughts and feelings? And then if you begin to feel anxious, what can you do to catch your breath and ground yourself? What does support look like for you? And it's so important, again, as mentioned earlier, to recognize the experience is unique for everyone. As you, as the people you love, navigate grief, and grieving, finding your way is going to look different for everyone. And in the work of Doka and Martin highlight metabolizing grief and loss and how unique that is for individuals. So I ask that you consider what this looks like or feels like for you and for the people you love. Because I often see conflict when I hear from people saying, I want to talk to my partner or my son or my dad or my mom, but they don't want to talk to me. Taking a look at this, the way we as individuals metabolize grief and loss, I often refer to it as like being right-handed or left-handed. We're hardwired a given way, but of course there is a continuum in this experience. What does this look like for you? Intuitive grievers metabolize their grief through being. They primarily seek emotional or spiritual outlets and prefer connections eye to eye. These will be folks that will wanna sit down, look someone in the eye, bear their soul, talking about their experience, processing emotionally and spiritually what this loss is like for them. Intuitive grievers integrate their grief through emotions and meaning making. Now, conversely, and again, I don't say conversely with judgment, I just mean like being right-handed or left-handed, instrumental grievers, think of an instrument as an outlet. Instrumental grievers metabolize through doing. So instrumental grievers will primarily seek cognitive or mental outlets or physical outlets. So engaging the mind and the body. And they prefer connections shoulder to shoulder. Think driving in a car, going for a walk, sitting in an information session, or back to back. Instrumental grievers will not be as comfortable sitting across from someone and being asked to bear their soul. In fact, it's often like speaking a language that you just don't speak. And quite often talk therapy certainly disadvantages people who are instrumental grievers. It doesn't speak to their strengths and their interests. Instrumental grievers will integrate grief through doing something, through their thoughts or their actions. Think about what this looks like for you and for the people you love. 
because it's so important to first acknowledge what your needs are and how to build on your strengths as you metabolize loss and grief. So just giving a visual representation here, I often kind of think about this as a, as a bit of a map. First, reflecting on the impact of loss and grief itself. And mentally, what is that impact like? Certainly, I hear from some people who say I'm having trouble focusing, where others say that it's a matter of rumination. They can't stop thinking about an event or an experience. Physical impact of loss and grief. Some people will have trouble sleeping or falling asleep at all, or they'll sleep a lot. They might have trouble eating and the complete loss of their appetite when others might eat a lot, overeat in fact. Some people talk about a heaviness in their chest. Again, this is so unique. Those are just a couple of examples. Emotionally, there's such a range of emotional experiences and expressions. And many people talk about the immense sadness or anger, frustration. But also, a lot of people talk about guilt around feeling happy. And happiness is absolutely a part of moving forward. And being gentle with yourself if you're judging yourself around feeling happy again. And spiritually, considering the impact spiritually for people, some people certainly turn towards religion and others turn away from it. And when I say religion, I also want to acknowledge that spirituality may mean religion for you. It may mean anything that gives your life meaning in a completely non-denominational way. So first, it's acknowledging certainly mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and practically how loss and grief has impacted your life. And then using that information, recognizing that changes day to day, hour to hour. Using that information, that important data, as Susan David talked about, to fuel you, to focus on your healing going forward. What do you do to care for yourself mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and practically? Again, considering how unique this continuum is, whether you're an instrumental or intuitive griever. The first step, though, is acknowledgement and the power in that acknowledgement because we cannot grieve if we don't first acknowledge the loss or losses and the impact of those losses. Have you considered, have you acknowledged, have you honored your losses as part of your healing? It's so important. And while indeed, as I highlighted earlier, there is an oscillation, a movement back and forth from loss to restoration, how do you acknowledge and honor your losses? And this is from Megan Devine, and I'm going to highlight a book of hers in just a moment, but she's got a brilliant social media account, and her name on social media is called Refuge in Grief. I highly recommend you take a look. And Megan goes on to say, accepting your own grief as worthy of respect helps create a world where all loss is held as worthy. These are the words of Dr. Kate Bowler, who's a Canadian who happens to be living in the States. And her TED Talk, I highly recommend. And the name of her TED Talk may resonate with many of you. Dr. Kate Bowler, after the birth of her child and starting her dream job as a PhD researcher, she was diagnosed with stage four cancer. And I'm thrilled to say that Kate is managing and alive and well, and I'm gonna highlight a podcast of her shortly. But this TED Talk is called Everything Happens for a Reason, meaning she was often told that after receiving her cancer diagnosis. So the title of her TED Talk is Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved. I highly recommend you take a look at it. But in the words of Dr. Kate Bowler, she says, I see the world is jolted by events that are wonderful and terrible, gorgeous and tragic, and I can't reconcile the contradiction, except that I'm beginning to believe that these opposites do not cancel each other out. Life is so beautiful and life is so hard. And coming back to Dr. Brene Brown, it's important to consider that an experience of collective pain does not deliver us from grief or sadness. It is a ministry of presence. And these moments remind us that we are not alone in our darkness and that our broken heart is connected to every heart that has known pain since the beginning of time. 
So what does it mean for you to care for yourself, to acknowledge and honor your losses and grief? So I'd like to share some considerations for self-care and some resources as you move forward. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes from Ralph Waldo Emerson, talking about what lies behind us and what lies before us are small matters compared to what lies within us. Now to be clear, that is not minimizing or dismissing grief and bereavement, but simply reflecting on, as I often hear from many people say, they feel weak or broken or don't know how they'll go on and move forward. What lies within you that you can turn to and nurture as part of you as you look to heal and move forward, honoring your grief and loss? In the words of Arthur Ashe, a brilliant athlete who, of course, faced so much stigma and judgment, not just in terms of the sport that he played as he played as an athlete, but also the diagnosis, the cancer, and certainly the AIDS that he lived with and died from. In the words of Arthur Ashe, he talked about start where you are, use what you can. Sorry, I apologize. Start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. Many people talk about, I don't know how to begin. I don't know what steps to take. It's about doing the best you can. And I appreciate doing the best you can on a given day might be 10%. And the following day might be 40. And the next day might be 100. And then you might be back to 15% after that. Start each day with what you can. Because you can't do more than that. And in the words of Vincent Van Gogh, this is so important to recognize how human this experience is. It's not about weakness. It's about recognizing that we're always doing what we cannot do yet in order to learn how to do it. How can you be gentle and compassionate with yourself as you move forward? This is from a fabulous um, online resource called Modern Loss, also a fantastic book that I'm gonna highlight in a second. But in the words of Eric Meyer, who writes about the death of his daughter, in moments when you can barely comprehend the world, when you can barely find the will to stand up, the prescribed motions of ritual can help you keep moving. So, so much of this is about the power of connection and reflecting on that whole person impact, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, and practical. There's a power in connecting. And certainly the power of connecting within a community, of course, looks very different in the face of COVID. But how do we connect with a sense of community? A community can be a people, a group of people living in the same place. But community is also a group of people having a particular characteristic in common, like facing a chronic or life-limiting illness, like facing dying or death, like facing grief and bereavement. A community is a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals, hearing the voices of others that have experienced grief and are grieving can be so impactful. And as mentioned earlier, in terms of post-traumatic growth, stories of others moving forward are always important as part of our healing journey. And whether that's in person, whether that's through a story that you've read, whether that's hearing someone's voice on a podcast, whether that connection is being out in nature, whatever that connection is for you, where do you find that power and connection? At the same time, it's also recognizing how boundaries are so essential in self-care. Why are boundaries important for you? Now, for some people, they may have been abundantly aware of this before cancer entered their lives. Boundaries are so essential in grief and grieving. And I ask you to consider what are some healthy boundaries that you can establish or re-establish to promote your self-care and your healing? I think everyone knows what it feels like to be tapped out, to be feeling burned out. What can you do to establish or reestablish boundaries? And first and foremost, it begins with considering what gives your life meaning and how can you honor this as part of your healing as you grieve. Again, from Instagram, self-care is going to look different for everybody. What's true for you? How do you first acknowledge what you need? 
And how do you then make space to that for that? In the words of Nora McInerney, who's a brilliant writer and podcaster, it's written extensively about loss and grief. Humor is part of her dialogue. But after certainly experience of a miscarriage and the death of her husband, Nora talks about when we talk about boundaries, it's not about what we're trying to keep out. It's what we are trying to protect and grow on the inside of those boundaries. What do these boundaries look like in your self-care as you begin healing? And exploring what you can control is a big part of that thinking about boundaries. And this is actually a card that I carry in my wallet from an internship I did 25 years ago in a residential addiction treatment center. What I found very quickly is when I started working in the healthcare system, this applied to everything. And I mean with the most reverence, whatever your higher power is, however you ground yourself, whatever gives your life meaning, how do you focus? and ask for, aspire to the serenity, to accept the change, the, sorry, to, to ask for the serenity to accept the things that we cannot change. Asking for the courage to change the things we can. And thinking about boundaries again, it's so important to recognize and ask for the wisdom to know the difference. What can you control? What can you carry and what do you need to put down or let go of? That wisdom is so essential, but finding the serenity and courage within that process is so important as part of healing. Again, from Instagram, what are some things that you can control, especially when things can feel so out of control? Self-talk is one of the biggest things that either supports people or harms them. What's your self-talk like? How can you be more compassionate with yourself? Also considering that boundaries are something we can control, as mentioned, but how we love, who we love, our reactions and our responses are also within our control. And yes, I appreciate this is all a practice. Our expectations, what expectations we hold and what expectations we let go of. Certainly cho choosing things, tools, strategies, methods to ground ourselves, to guide us through those anxious moments or moments of feeling overwhelmed. And breathing. When we feel out of control, connecting with our breath is so important. And I say connecting because as we know, especially now, breath is a privilege, not a right. We can actually use our breath to connect to the present moment and guide us and ground us. And there's actually science that shows us this sympathetic nervous system or the response, what people know and might feel as a fight or flight or freeze response. We can shift from that sympathetic nervous system to the parasympathetic ner nervous system to a rest and digest response simply by connecting with our breath. Connecting with our breath. And you feel your breath if you notice, again, thinking about the power of acknowledgement, thinking of what your breath feels like if you're anxious or feeling overwhelmed. Now, this is not to dismiss the thoughts or feelings that come with it, but to simply connect with our breath to create space, to give us space to respond instead of reacting. Connecting with our breath can be done simply through the practice of breathing and breathing out longer than you breathe in. I often suggest breathing in for a count of four, pausing, and breathing out for a count of six. Even trying that a few times, connecting with your breath can slow your heart rate down if you're feeling anxious or overwhelmed and give you a little bit of space to acknowledge what you're experiencing and what you might need to care for yourself. Connecting with your breath is also important to help metabolize those beautiful moments we have in our lives as well. How do you connect to the present moment? And how do you find ways to connect with your breath? I think so much of this is about considering what gives your life meaning, and this is not to minimize, dismiss, or overlook the tough stuff. In fact, because of the tough stuff, we can absolutely see 
what matters most. How do you make time to honor and acknowledge what gives your life meaning? These are the words of Dr. B.J. Miller. This is his photo on the right. And after experiencing a traumatic event at school, where he subsequently became a triple amputee and then went on to become a palliative care physician. Dr. B.J. Miller has a brilliant TED talk I highly recommend, but B.J. talks about that quality of life is not a consolation prize. And I've met so many people that say, my goal is to retire, my goal is to live to whatever age, but in the, in the meantime, their quality of life is overlooked. They make excuses. And I often see quality of life is only asked about when someone's facing end of life. Quality of life is not a consolation prize. What does it mean for you and for the people you love right now? How do you honor and acknowledge that? And what I often refer to it is, is finding the extraordinary in those otherwise ordinary moments. When I have seen so many people that would do anything to hug the person they love, to breathe fresh air, to fill their lungs, to eat their favorite food, or to step outside into nature, to hear the laughter of the people they love. How do you find honor and acknowledge those uh, extraordinary moments and those otherwise ordinary moments that many people in the absence of loss and grief don't appreciate how extraordinary those experiences, those moments are. It's about the process of healing. And in the words of Pema Chodron, she talks about when things fall apart. Things falling apart is a kind of testing and also a kind of healing. We think that the point is to pass the test or to overcome the problem. But the truth is things don't really get solved. They come together and they fall apart. Then they come together again and fall apart again. It's just like that. The healing comes from letting there be room for all of this to happen. Room for grief, for relief, for misery, for joy. And in making space for all of this, I wanna share some resources very briefly. And if any of these resonate with you, I encourage you to take a look online. Actively Moving Forward is a free app for grieving young adults aged 18 to 30 and for grieving adults aged over 30. It's also a community space for professionals who serve them. This is a free app. It's a place to connect. Remember I talked about the power of connection and the power of community. The AMF app is for grieving young adults from 18 to over 30. I also wanted to highlight this called A Part of Me. It's actually a video game that was built for grieving kids and teens, although I've met some young adults that play it as well. And this video game was built about navigating the grief experience. As it says, it's a world built to guide you through your darkest moments. It's a free app that you can download and play. As mentioned at the outset, I'm a community partner with the Children and Youth Grief Network. We have a range of free resources available from our website. So some of these are handbooks about understanding grief and grieving, some tip sheets about legacy projects, there's podcasts, certainly research that we do in this field. There's an e-learning module about parenting kids and teens through grief. We certainly do our most host community events, share community resources, and there are a number of expressive arts activities. All of these can be accessed for free through our website. Also, as mentioned, Canadian Virtual Hospice, I'm proud to say, is the largest online repository of information in the world for any individual family facing diagnosis of a serious or life-limiting illness all the way through their experience, whether their experience is curative or whether they're facing dying, death, and bereavement. It's also a resource for healthcare providers. And one of those resources that Canadian Virtual Hospice has created is a free resource called mygrief.ca. As you can see, it's confidential. You can access it in the privacy of your own home. It's developed by families and people who work in the field, and it's stories from others who've been there. But it's also a resource for healthcare professionals. Another one, as I mentioned, many adults say, I don't know what to tell the kids. This is certainly a resource that can create a space to help parents, caregivers navigate those conversations when someone is dying or has died. Living My Culture highlights conversations on care, culture, and spirituality when someone's facing a serious illness and grief. Again, another free resource from Canadian Virtual Hospice. I wanted to highlight these podcasts as well. And certainly I leave these as recommendations 
as I mentioned, you can see Nora in the top corner there. Kate Bowler is mentioned as well. Um, so these are a range of podcasts that speak to facing illness, grief, and loss. Um, again, when we talk about the power of connecting, of hearing the stories of others, I highly recommend these podcasts, hearing the voices of others who are navigating and are continuing to navigate their way through grief. Highlighting some books that I highly recommend as well. Again, simply recommendations, and there are many more, but just to start with these, I wanted to highlight these books. As people firsthand who work in the field or live the experience of navigating illness, loss, and grief. But I wanna close on this in the words of Dr. Rachel Naomi Remen, a physician and healer and incredible author. This is from her book, Kitchen Table Wisdom Stories That Heal. And when we think about loss and grief, I think it's also important to consider in the words of Dr. Remen, the most important questions don't seem to have ready answers, but the questions themselves have a healing power when they are shared. An answer is an invitation to stop thinking about something, to stop wondering. And as we know, life has no such stopping places. Life is a process whose every event is connected to the moment that just went by. An unanswered question is a fine traveling companion. It sharpens your eye for the road. So I want to acknowledge this. I think as we go forward, being lifelong learners, it's not a matter of arriving. There is no closure. We will always have more questions than answers. I think it's so important to acknowledge, how do you move forward? Acknowledging your experience, acknowledging your losses and then honoring that experience, honoring what you need to move forward as part of your healing, recognizing that there is no quick fix, there is no getting over, and some of these questions will continue to carry. So how do we wonder about these things together and connect with others who know what that experience is like? But first and foremost, honoring your own experience. So I wanna thank you all for sharing your time. And I welcome any opportunity to connect again. I certainly use my social media solely to share resources for individuals and families facing serious illness, but also for individuals and families and anyone facing loss and grief. So I welcome any opportunity to connect. And as always, I'm very grateful for your time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. We appreciate you taking the time and to share your experience, your expertise and insights with us today, Elizabeth. If you need more resources on grief, we encourage you to contact us by email at canadainfo at lls.org or by calling toll free at 1-833-222-4828. We also invite you to visit our website, bloodcancers.ca slash webcasts, to watch past webcasts or to register for any of our upcoming webcasts. Thank you all for watching. Have a wonderful day and stay safe.